escape my bride. Let's go for a ride in my new fangled automobile. Just where we will go, nobody knows, but it's sure a great way to feel. Behind the wheel of a speed beat of steel, it's my new fangled automobile. Hello and welcome to Vintage Car History. I'm Wild Bill. And as you can see, I am wearing a shirt with buttons on it. <laughs> yes, it has flowers and parrots as well. And some of you might be thinking of Jimmy Buffett. But how often do you stop and think about the buttons and zippers that are on our clothes and elsewhere? Zippers are a 20th century invention. But buttons have been around for millennia. So here's the question. Was it possible in the vintage era to turn buttons into a car? The answer is yes. And the man who did it was, of course, Louis Renault. Let's start with the buttons. From the 16th through to the early 20th century, buttons were seen as a symbol of status. If you were poor, your clothes usually didn't have them. A simple tunic or a lashed shirt and breeches with a belt. But expensive clothes had them. And the more pricey the article, the more buttons it had. Kings and queens, lords and ladies, anyone that wanted to display their wealth would do it with clothes festooned with buttons, and the fancier the better. So button making was serious business, and people buying them wanted incredible variety. Thus, to be a successful button maker, you needed to be able to make them out of just about anything. Metals, various woods, bone, ivory, precious stones, as well as make each one a work of art. And the most renowned button makers of France was the Renault family. By the 1870s, the button making Renaults of Paris owned several factories, were prominent and respected in French society, and, despite not having a, actually having any noble titles, were quite wealthy. At this time, the head of the family was Alfred and his wife Bertha. They had six children, number four being Louis Renault, born in 1877. Young Louis was naturally possessed with a mind for mechanics and engineering and had the run of daddy's factories. It's like growing up in a candy store and you have a big sweet tooth. <laughs> Machines and tools of all kinds were at his disposal, being used to make buttons out of just about anything. And of course, you had to have the engines that worked the machines and kept the factory spinning out products. Let's also keep in mind that young Louis was, besides being yet another mechanical Mozart, was also a scrawny, nerdy, rich kid without much social skills. He was a lot happier playing with the big steam engines in the factories that kept all the various lathes and saws moving than with other kids. By the time he was ready for serious school, he had a passion for only two things, engineering and getting his way. Daddy chose Le Say Contesse as the school to educate his irascible little budding engineer and being naturally inclined towards mechanical engineering, he excelled in that area. Coincidentally, the factory of Leon Serpolet was not far from campus, and he managed to spend time there tinkering, helping out, and learning about engines and cars. When not at school, he'd be at home or in the factories, fiddling with new small gas engines that were then coming out on the market. So he gets his degree in 1897 and heads back to the family factories, but he buys himself a graduation present, a brand new Didion Bouton gas-powered trike. And although it does go, he finds that he's not happy with it and parks it in his private workshop to do some tinkering. Well, he did more than just tinker. The trike had, of course, the five-horsepower single-cylinder engine that Mr. Bouton designed. And that's about the only thing Big Lou kept. He designed and built a new chassis, four wheels, undersprung chassis, rung and rack and pinion steering, three-speed transmission with reverse, driving the rear wheels through a drive shaft and differential instead of chains or belts. Big Lou's car was nothing like the De Dion Bouton he had purchased, and nothing like any other car out there for that matter. Now, y'all have heard me say that engineers as a species typically are not satisfied with their first designs. And Mr. Renault was no exception. He finishes his little car in 1898 and names it Voiturette, which very creatively means little car. And like a lot of engineers with eccentricity, I'm being kind here, chose to do his first demonstration of his first work to a few friends on Christmas Eve, in this case 1898. 
Now, he did prepare for this demo. Since this was now his car, he carefully chiseled away the Didion Bouton mark that was on the engine block and badged the car with his name. After all, this was his design and should bear his name, right? Yet, he was not planning on trying to actually produce this car as a new concern, rather as a toy for himself and the few friends that he had. But something unexpected happened. His first design was actually a home run, and 12 of the festive party goers threw money at him and demanded that he build them a Christmas present. And orders in hand, Big Lou established Renault Ferret. Louis would be joined by some of his brothers shortly after, and his company, the Renault Automotive Company, would establish as not only one of the greatest car makers of the vintage era, but also of all time. Thanks for watching Vintage Car History. We'll see you next week. Peace.